Hey there, guys. All right, today we are returning to some alternate history hub. It's been a hot minute. Can't remember the last time I watched some uh, of alternate history hub. I really can't. Wow. Okay. Anyways, this time, this, this one is the decision that ruined the Middle East. You've heard me complain about this multiple times. So now we're going to complain about it some fucking more. <laughs> That's right. Before we dive in, make sure you go and check out the links in the description box below. I would love it if you checked out the disc uh, Kickstarter. That's the most important link right now to me because there is free, free, free stuff. Free stuff in there. Well, uh, free prologue and free five chapters of my fantasy novel. Uh, you can read those, you can download those, print them off, whatever the fuck you want to do and read them. Um, so, yeah. Um, Anything else that I say at the beginning of these videos? I don't think I do. Go check it out. And if you are feeling generous, I'd love the support. Anyways, that's out of the way. Let's fucking return to alternate history hub. Dude, my brain is fried. Studying history is important because it brings in something we often never get. Context. Con yeah. Yeah, no, legitimately, the, the change over the four years that I spent, four and a half years that I spent at, at university, um, really getting that, just the way your brain kind of changes in thinking about things because of well when the field you're in right my brain constantly thinking of con the context of situations the whys and the hows because that's ex that's what you have to think about when you're studying history it's the only thing you really concern yourself with are the whys and the hows um and mainly the whys you're really just trying to understand people is essential history understanding people of the past the reasons people make the decisions that they did um and then explaining it right and to properly explain things you need context you need you need context to situations it's just oh it's cool i like that shit. i like seeing i like you know i like seeing the change over time of things uh and when people you know go to university a lot of change happens because they're growing. They're learning new things. They're pursuing, possibly pursuing their passions. Context for how a particular event played out. Context for how something changed. And context for how the past always plays a role in affecting our lives. In the present, we kind of just write off the Middle East as a place that has always been a region of fundamentalism, dictators, and civil wars. But it didn't have to be. History is chock full I mean... Europe is, you know, full of civil wars too. With divergent points, wow, crucial fighting. decisions that led to certain changes for better or worse. There is always the joke that we live in the darkest timeline, and after doing lots of research, I think that's actually true in regards to the Arab world. A place of failed states and terrorism was not at all the destiny for the region set in stone. One single decision ruined the entire region before it had a chance. No, I'm not talking about the United States invading Iraq or Russia being involved in Syria. <laughs> I'm saying that Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon never were supposed to exist in the first place. So when did this decision take place? It wasn't from a decision millennia or even centuries ago. It happened at the end of World War I. The Ottoman Empire once ruled the entire Middle East. For centuries, they had oppressed people from Europe and Arabia alike. By the time of the 20th century, their land and power had diminished considerably. The final nail in the coffin for them was betting on the Central Powers. As <laughs> the war raged on, the Ottoman Front was not really considered important compared to the European fronts. They were the sick man of Europe, and the Germans and Austrians were seen as bigger threats. It was a sideshow to Britain and France. That didn't mean that the Ottomans weren't entirely useless. They were losing power, and the British knew that they could exploit this weakness by gaining the help of people who were also sick of Turkish rule, the Arabs. 
You might know this rebellion because it involved Lawrence of Arabia, who helped the Arab rebels fight against the Ottomans. Now, although Lawrence of Arabia is kinda a modern mythical figure today, at the time the Arab rebellion against the unimportant Turks in a desert far away was not seen as very important. It was deemed the sideshow to a sideshow. For their support in the war, yeah. the Arabs agreed with the British on one condition. If the Arabs fought against the Ottomans, then after the war, they would be able to organize their own unified Arab state. That was the understanding. Until, well, the war actually ended. When the mm-hmm. 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 Been saying mm -hmm. Great War was over and the Ottomans surrendered. It's probably just gonna be me nodding my head and agreeing with whatever the fuck uh Cody says here. <laughs> Their land was now up for grabs at the negotiating table. And that's when the Arabs got the bad news. That previous agreement was not actually going to happen. It turned out that two years earlier, France and Britain, in secret, had decided that they wanted the land for themselves. This was called the Sykes-Picot Agreement. It was a secret pact by both countries to split the Ottoman territories among themselves, nicely divided into Zone A and Zone B, the humble origins of what would become Syria and Iraq. You see, France had invested resources into the Syrian region for decades, stuff like electricity and schools. So to them, it was only natural that they would take Syria as a French dominion in the Mediterranean. The British already own Egypt, and the nice canal included. So they wanted territory that could protect their strategic interest in Egypt if they had to. Long story short, there's a lot of debating between the two to finalize just where French Syria would end and British Arabia began. The Arabs weren't involved, don't be silly. <laughs> By the end of the war, the United States was now the bright-eyed new power that could tell the older Europeans a thing or two. Woodrow Wilson... Eh, no, it wasn't. That's not until World War... Eh. I mean, they started... I'd say they started somewhat listening to the United States by the end of World War I, but they still largely disregarded Woodrow Wilson. And also, Cody and I are in agreement here. Fuck Woodrow Wilson. ...was a staunch anti-colonialist, and his negative attitudes towards global empire was what America brought to the table. Consent of the governed was an idea that America preached frequently at the grumbling of everyone else. However, your Wait a minute, hold on. I didn't hear that. ...was an idea that America preached frequently at the grumbling of everyone else. However, okay. Europe did listen to one Wilson idea. The establishment of a League of Nations, a proto-UN. That would be for peace and prevent wars, which it certainly did. <laughs> one of the yeah. things this new League of Nations did was establish the idea of mandates. A mandate is when an allied power takes control of former German and Ottoman land and governs it to protect the natives from the modern world, at least until they're able to protect themselves. The, an evolution or an extension of the white man's burden. No, you silly, it's not spoils of war, it's international diplomacy. What are you talking about? We'll just- It's not colonialism, it's international diplomacy. Take these for now. For global peace. This established the new ter I mean mandates of the Middle East. The French mandate of Syria, the British mandates of Palestine, Transjordan, and Iraq were set up at least until the natives could take care of themselves. It was just Which of course is up to the determination of the colon I mean of governor. The, the European. It's a coincidence these mandate borders lined up perfectly with the agreement before the league even existed, but that don't think about it. At the time, British and French were competing with one another over their ever-expanding empires that would certainly never collapse until they did. Two decades after the decision to split up the Arabs was made, World War II effectively destroyed the homelands of France and Britain. Now America was a global superpower, and this spelled the death of colonialism and the two empires. Well, we can't say it spelled the death of colonialism. That is, of course, you know, oversimplifying and it spelled the death of fat old fashioned colonialism and spawned neo colonialism although really you could argue neo colonialism didn't really come to be until it didn't really happen immediately after world war 2 it kind of came to be uh towards the latter half of the 20th century um i'd say post korea i think is largely where i would maybe if I had to give a definitive pinpoint, that's probably where I would mark neocolonialism. Um, 
Although you could also argue the uh, Monroe Doctrine, right? That's what it was called. No, no, wrong one. I'm thinking the wrong one. Um, that's the thing from the 19th century. Shit. Uh, I'm thinking of the uh, U.S. loans, the money the U.S. dumped into Europe uh, after World War II. What the fuck was the name of that? Dude, I'm bro. Oh man, I used to know that. I can blank it on the name, but. Um, when all that money was dumped in, you could argue that's also neo-colonialism. Um, because the U.S. is essentially giving money away to be like, yo, don't go to the commies, stay with us. Remember the idea that mandates should be ruled until they're able to take care of themselves? Well, conveniently, after the war, the mandates were granted independence. Now the mandates that were made artificially without the consent of the natives were legal modern nation states. Good luck everyone, no changing the borders now. That means <laughs> you Kurds. This is the fundamental flaw of the modern Middle East. These borders only exist because they were strategically important to long gone empires. And we're seeing today the effects of this. It isn't that Europe made the Middle East a violent place, it's always been that. It's that these borders split people up who wanted to be together and made countries out of people who didn't want anything to do with one another. If people in your country can't get along, then you have an unstable society. Strongmen dictators usually take hold of unstable societies, as we've seen time and time again. However, that isn't the actual reason why I made this video. Simply segmenting people into nations isn't directly the cause, even if it's a massive contribution. What was the ultimate genesis for all of these issues was the betrayal of that agreement. And how yep. that betrayal accidentally led to the rise of Islamic terrorism. In the original agreement, the... Yes, this is the most important part. Now, of course, like, when I say the Sykes-Picot agreement caused a lot of the issues that we see today, and is well, pretty much the reason at fault here. It isn't because of the create necessarily cause. I'm not saying this because it's the creation of these artificial borders that are not natural to the people groups living here. That plays a part. However, that's something that, of course, can be changed, right? Um, now, of course, the people in like Syria, Iraq, Turkey, they don't want the those those gov those three governments don't want the Kurds to be an independent state. Um. Uh, you know, and you know, Jordan I think is working out, is doing okay as a country with its borders. Uh, Israel, you know, has problems. The Saudis, they're doing okay, and they're invading Yemen. Uh. Um, and causing a genocide in Yemen. Um, but when you talk about the Sex Pico Agreement and it being the issue, it is this issue precisely that is being spoken about. It is the breaking of the trust, right? Already for centuries, there, um, the Middle East has had no reason to really trust European or Western powers because of the Crusades. And now, you know, coming back, and they're essentially the Europeans are proving still cannot be trusted, <laughs> right? Like, first they came in with their crusaders, forced religion upon us, and slaughtered innocents, as well as their own fellow Christians um, in the crusades. And then here they come several centuries later, forcing things down upon us after agreeing to an agreement. And then they just backstab the agreement. The Middle East has no reason to trust the West. And that is the big problem. That is the problem of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. The British were going to allow the Arabs to control their own state. One that controlled this region. It was to be ruled by the Sharif of Mecca, Hussein bin Ali. He was to be the king of the Arabs. Because of the British decision to make the land instead mandates, this hurt their relationship with the Sharif. At the time, the Arabian Peninsula was not united. Instead, it was being fought between mainly two different factions. Hussein bin Ali was a member of the Hashemites, 
the tribe of the Prophet Muhammad. By the 1920s, a powerful family called the House of Saud had been conquering territory throughout the region. The Sauds believed in an ultra-conservative sect of Islam called Wahhabism, or Salafism. It was fundamentalist, far more than any at the time. Because of this diplomatic breakdown between the Hashemites and the British due to the Sykes-Picot Agreement in the first place, instead of ruling a significant larger portion of land, Hussein ruled a small kingdom on the coast. By the 1920s, without British support, it was conquered by the Sauds. If that name sounds familiar, it's because Sauds renamed the region the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So an ultra-conservative kingdom now ruled over a fair bit of land instead of a more moderate one. This wasn't much of an issue, at least until the 1950s, when Saudi Arabia discovered their vast, vast oil supplies. Salafism is a religious movement with the main goal to bring Islam back to an ultra-conservative mindset. When the Sauds discovered oil, that extreme ideology now was funded by billions and billions of dollars in oil money. So what did Saudi Arabia do? They built mosques, schools, funded scholarships, funded journalists, universities, professors, and militants all over the Islamic... Okay, he's taking it farther than I would have, but I entirely agree with world him. ...to abide by their version of conservative and violent Islam. Frankly put, oil money funded a religious and cultural shift around the globe. New groups like Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, ISIS, all were born, inspired by this one particular teaching of Islam. So the Sykes-Picot Agreement did two things. It set the stage for a fundamentalist regime to rise instead of a moderate one, which then funded a violent cultural shift in the Islamic world and split the region into mandates like Iraq and Syria who were never meant to actually govern themselves and shockingly collapsed. Yes, this is truly the darkest timeline for the Arab world. Now, does this excuse the decisions of both Arab and Western leaders in recent times? No. Does this mean that the Middle East was a perfect place of sunshine and happiness before? Yes. No. Oh. It's an example of how history that we might not have heard of can culminate to shape our everyday lives. The war on terror, Syria, the refugee crisis, all in many ways stem from the single decision from empires long gone. I don't have the answer. I can only attempt to imagine a world where it didn't occur, which was actually what this video was supposed to be about, but instead became 80% history since nobody would actually know what I was talking about. So take this as a prequel of sorts. I want to imagine a world where this decision never happened, and the best solution was to just make a separate video for it. History always influences our lives, even if it's people and events we never thought of before. And that's why bringing in context can also shape our ideas of how our world today truly came to be. This is Cody of Alternate History Hub. And that was the decision that ruined the Middle East. <clears throat> this was well made. I have nothing to add here at the end of the video. Um, Cody does a, has, did a great job here. I hope you guys enjoyed as well. Remember to hit that like button and subscribe for more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.